Greetings. Greetings. I'm Steve Graff, President, President, President and CEO of the Alumni Association of the University of Michigan. I'd like to welcome you to the first event of the virtual Pan-Asia series. Every year since 2010, Michigan alumni from across Asia have convened in May to reconnect with one another and with our university. This event has become known as the UM Pan-Asia Reunion. To honor the spirit of this great event during the pandemic, we have designated four of many outstanding virtual events as special Pan-Asia events. This first session is titled U.S.-China Relations During COVID-19, Finding a Path Forward. We are glad that you're joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at future Pan-Asia Reunion virtual events. To begin, I'd like to introduce Michael Barr, Dean of the Ford School of Public Policy. Thanks so much, Steve. It's a real uh, pleasure and honor to be here today uh, to help moderate this conversation on U.S.-China relations. We have a, just a wonderful uh, team of people. Uh, we've got Ken Lieberthal, uh, who's an emeritus professor of the University of Michigan, a uh, longtime China hand and uh, former uh, senior official on the national security staff. Uh, Mary Gallagher, who runs the International Institute, is professor of political science and uh, former head of the uh, Ken Lieberthal Rich Rogel Center for Chinese Studies at the University of Michigan. Uh, and we have Anne Chi Lin, uh, professor of uh, public policy at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I'm just delighted to have all three of you uh, here today for this conversation. It's obviously a, a really complicated and difficult time uh, in U.S.-Chinese uh, relations. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine um, a, uh, a more difficult set of circumstances facing the two countries, both now and projecting forward um, into, the, into the near-term future. Before we get started on today's problems, though, I thought it would be helpful for us to take a step back. Uh, maybe not uh, all the way through Chinese history, uh, but let's uh, go back to the to the 1990s and the thinking in U.S. Chinese relations at the time. What what was the United States trying to do in uh, reshaping the relationship with China in the 1990s and going forward? And you know what what was China trying to do? So maybe let's uh, let's start there, and I'll ask Ken to uh, lead us off, and then turn to Mary and Ann. Uh, sure. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, you have to keep in mind the Soviet bloc disintegrated, the Soviet Union disintegrated, uh, and one of the original uh, drivers of our policy toward China that Richard Nixon began was to have better relations with China and, and the Soviet Union each that then they had with each other and so use each to kind of advance our agenda with the other uh, we recast that relationship in terms of substance uh, i think by the late 90s uh, a major focus was to uh, in many ways uh, normalize china's economic relations with the rest of the world so there was a big push to negotiate china's entry into the world trade organization uh, that was during the Clinton administration. That's when I served on the National Security Council. So I uh, had a good sense of what we were seeking to achieve, and what we did achieve, I think, in our negotiation. And uh, that was really a negotiation that you know was based on the premise that if China remains outside of the rules of the game globally, uh, that uh, you can't have global rules. We have 20% of the human race uh, in the middle of the fastest growing region in the world, uh, uh, not, playing by the same, not playing the same game at all. And uh, so we negotiated a very tough uh, Chinese accession agreement that opened up their economy a great deal. Uh, then uh, for, that, was, that was part of the effort. And uh, another part of the effort was in the Asian financial crisis in 1997-98, uh, um, uh, we really needed to work with China 
to prevent a kind of competitive devaluation of currencies in Asia. Uh, and that worked out successfully. Uh, we worked with China on it and we coordinated policies and uh, it was in fact uh, very important for getting through the Asian financial crisis. And then finally, we wanted China to become a responsible stakeholder in the international arena. Asia being a, an arena of enormous conflict, uh, major wars going back for a long time, and tensions were still high throughout the region. And uh, we thought by bringing China into the game in a constructive way, uh, we could reduce the chances of war, reduce military budgets around the region, uh, and uh, continue a, a, a set of developments that would have as a major uh, dividend, um, reducing the chances of conflict around the region, especially major war around the region. I would argue that uh, it's notable that since we began engaging with China, there has not been a major war in Asia. Uh, and uh, defense budgets in most of the region have gone down. Uh, and uh, so I think overall it was a, it was a transition from uh, trying to uh, incentivize the Soviet Union to, to uh, reach some arms control agreements with us and so forth, uh, to building China into the international economy in a constructive way. By no means a blind engagement, it was a tough step-by-step uh, -step set of processes. And I think it, uh, it was the right set of moves. Thanks, Ken. That's, I think, really a uh, helpful background. Mary, can you tell us a little bit about um, the Chinese perspective on the last 25 years? I mean, thinking back to that time period, what was the Chinese government trying to do? I know they're thinking differently about what happened uh, today than they did maybe 25 years ago. But if you if you bring us back to that moment, looking forward, what was what was China thinking that um, this period was about? So I, I mean, going back all the way to the very beginning of the um, process of normalization, going back to the Nixon administration, the goal of the Chinese uh, regime at the time, led by Deng Xiaoping, was to develop China, to make China prosperous, to make China a strong nation, and to bring it back from what it had become in the 1960s under uh, the late years of Mao, which was a very weak and poor and unstable um, polity. And that's, of course, China has transformed itself over the course of that time with a lot of help from its global integration that was aided, like Ken is pointing out, by the United States. I think um, in retrospect, um, both in China and in the United States, if we look back to the 1990s, I don't think anyone really expected that China would be as successful as it was with this model of state capitalism, which isn't to say that it doesn't have problems, that it doesn't have a lot of challenges going forward. But I think one of the things that uh, the United States is struggling with now is simply the success that has occurred over the course of the last 25 years. A lot of Chinese uh, and American companies have benefited from the massive expansion of trade, the massive expansion of supply chains into China's domestic economy. So um, I think what we're dealing with right now is partly the realization of that success really changes the, the power structure globally. Yeah, for, for sure we live in a, a very different world than we did uh, 25 years ago in terms of uh, the distribution of power. And I wonder, Anne, whether how you think about um, the rise of China in terms of its power in the region and and, and more broadly uh, in the world today. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Michael. I, I, I just building on what Mary and Ken have said. Um, China's really a different country, living in a different world um, than it was at the end of the 20th century. Um, it has relationships not only with the United States, of course, but with you know, all the countries in the world, it's undergone, it's undertaken to really develop its relationships in Africa um, and in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, um, even in Central Asia, and as well as in the, what we think of as developed countries. Um, and so I think we have to understand that the power that the U.S. has um, to shape 
China's image or the power that the U.S. has to let China in to the rules of the world um, is no longer the same as it was um, at the end of the 20th century. The U.S. is a different country now as well, but China is a really different country and it has a lot of relationships with other countries that are really going to stand and fall based on those bilateral relationships. Thanks, Anne. Uh, as, um, as all of you have mentioned, the, the transition over the last 25 years has had enormous consequences, uh, both in the United States and in China. So uh, the, the rapid growth of the Chinese economy has helped to lift uh, millions and millions of people out of poverty uh, around the world, along with uh, growth in India and, and many of the other uh, major developing economies. But the, the progress in China has been remarkable in terms of uh, poverty alleviation globally. And uh, beyond that, obviously, the creation in China of uh, vast uh, wealth, uh, creation of a large group of people with uh, significant uh, resources, uh, growth of a, uh, what we would call a middle class. Um, in the United States, uh, there's been um, some significant pain uh, that has come in the last 25 years um, some people say in part because of the entry of China into the global trading system, uh, declines in manufacturing, particularly hard hit communities um, that are most affected by global trade. How do you think about the adjustment in the U.S.? Um, what's the role of the relationship with China in, in those disruptions in the U.S.? How should we think about um, the effects you know, here on the ground? You know, I, I think that the uh, decline of manufacturing in the U.S., uh, the loss of a lot of union jobs, uh, increases in inequality of wealth, uh, all those things are real. And China's entry into the world and China's practices uh, around the world have contributed to that. Uh, just as at the same time they've contributed to reduce prices for consumers in the U.S., you know, a lot of other things. That are, and when uh, General Motors invests in China, makes money there, a lot of those profits come back to the U.S. and pay for the pensions of General Motors workers who are now retired. You know, so this is a complicated set of issues, hard to uh, capture in two minutes or so. Uh, I think one of our major problems uh, over the last 25 years has been a failure on our side to, uh, uh, to invest in infrastructure, uh, to make the tax system fairer to workers, uh, to, uh, to uh, do things like uh, support a higher minimum wage, uh, to invest more in education. I mean, these are all pretty obvious things that we should be doing. Uh, but we have not done them. And then the global financial crisis in 2009 uh, really you know, knocked the whole world off kilter. Uh, and, and then the politics of recovery from that uh, made it very, very difficult for us to make the kinds of investments that we really needed to make. We had a short-term stimulus, but then after the 2010 election, midterm election, it was you know, uh, we were sharply constrained in what we could do. Uh, so I think all of that, as uh, you know, you have to recognize what you've done, what the other side has done. China has behaved well in some ways, badly in others. Uh, we've done the same, but frankly, we haven't. I mean, a, a lot of our problems are domestic more than international. We haven't, I think that's right, Ken. We haven't made the investments uh, in, in our workers. Uh, we haven't done that in training and job creation. We haven't supported unions um, in, in uh, their support of workers. We haven't made the investments in infrastructure and schools. I do think that the, the, the basic compact that was proposed uh, in thinking about globalization was globalization is beneficial overall for the, for the economy, but we know that it hurts some people and helps some people in differentially. And the idea was that there were supposed to be investments in uh, the people who uh, get hurt uh, sometimes by trade imbalances and by, uh, by changes in trade. And that uh, didn't really happen. 
Mary, I wonder how how is this period affected a typical, you know, what's the the typical worker in China? How are they affected by the massive changes in in the Chinese economy? What kinds of protections do they have? What kinds of concerns do they have in this um, rapidly transforming period? Well, I mean, I, I agree what 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 you're both saying about the U.S. and about the need for you know social protection and trade compensation and to protect people from the downsides of globalization. Um, and of course, for China, which was starting out at a much much lower level of development and wage structure, um, generally speaking, you know, it's a positive story in terms of income. Incomes have gone up. Uh, poverty has gone down urbanization has uh, rapidly happened so that more and more people are working in cities and increasingly also working in services. But China also is really, I think, failing on the social insurance and the social welfare supports that it needs to maintain economic um, growth. If it's going to be consumer-led growth, as they keep on saying they want to do, you know, post-COVID, that it has to come from domestic consumption, not from government investment, not from only exports, then China also needs to make a transition where it supports uh, its workforce with better uh, welfare, um, better employment security. China's system is different than ours in the sense that it's highly dualistic so that there are people in urban areas still that have relatively good job security, that have pensions, that have medical access to medical insurance. But the vast majority of the people from the rural uh, countries, the, from rural areas that have moved into cities continue after 30 years to not have those um, basic supports. And COVID, like in every single country, COVID exposes social inequality. And the social inequality that it exposed in China is the vast differences between urban and rural people, particularly rural people who live in cities. Thanks, Mary. I, I, um, I, I'd like to pull us forward now to, as you were, you were doing with uh, COVID-19 to the present day, uh, the relationship is in a lot of trouble um, uh, on the trade front, um, issues of human rights, COVID-19 itself, um, uh, tensions in the South China Sea, and, and really more broadly, uh, a question about the role of China and the U.S. in the global ecosystem, uh, political system and economic system. So uh, maybe we'll pick uh, each of those apart just a little bit. Um, and and maybe I'll start with you. How, how do you view um, China's rise in the power structure in the global system? How should um, how does it view its role in the world, and and maybe how should we view its role in the world? So, I think it's so. Uh, colleagues and I did a survey in eighteen countries on COVID beliefs and behaviors in June, and one of the amazing things that I think we found is that you, you know we talk all the time about this <clears throat> American suspicion towards China, China's suspicion to the United States, the part of the world in which um, countries were most likely to blame people in co other countries were most likely to blame China. Um, for the COVID-19 crisis was in South Asia. So South Asia is a place, South Southeast Asia, a place where China has invested a lot of money, um, where there's been a you know, great increase in trade, um, where there's been a lot of people to people um, movement, people going to China to study, traders going to China, coming back, vice versa, and of course, Chinese immigrants going out. Um, and, I think that really says something about where China is that I think in the in 10 years ago uh, there's an, particularly with the Belt and Road Initiative there's been this sense um, that if China can go out, it can you know, help other countries um, with their development goals, it can along the way improve its own development, economic development, then it's a win-win for everybody. And it's a way of getting out from under the <coughs> responsibilities or the rules um, of the game that the US wants to impose on China. But I think what we see um, in this period is that um, Belt and Road and all of these other economic initiatives don't necessarily 
create um, create a good reputation for China, create favor for China. Um, and so it's really important to start thinking about um, how China, China, I think it's important for China to understand how it manages its multilateral and bilateral relationships. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, I think there's been um, some some survey data about the status of various countries in the world. And at least on that measure, the U.S. has not been doing very well uh, lately. And I wonder whether um, uh, Ken or, or Mary, you want to talk about um, the relative positions of China and the U.S. in this in this rapidly changing environment. Kind of who, who has sunk farther? Right? Uh, and uh, Pew uh, did a uh, regularly does these surveys and uh, so has a lot of historical data to, to kind of calibrate a benchmark uh, what reputations how they've changed. And uh, we have pointed repeatedly to the fact that China's reputation in terms of uh, do you have a favorable view of China and uh, do you trust China's top leader to make to do the right thing? Uh, in both cases, in uh, both questions, China's uh, plummeted. Uh, and you have, uh, you know, in many countries now, a fundamentally negative view of both China's top leadership decision making and of China overall and what it's doing. Uh, what we tend not to point to is if you go through the same data, what you find is that the U.S. has plummeted farther. Uh, both in terms of do you trust the top leader to do the right thing uh, and uh, do you have an overall favorable view uh, of the United States. Um, so it's, you know, neither of us has been served well in terms of global reputation. Uh, and each of us, I would argue, especially on the U.S. side, we have increasingly in Asia, especially, tried to get countries to kind of choose between us as to which way you're going to where you're going to put your trust and, and where you're going to cooperate. And it's a choice that I'm not aware of any country in Asia uh, that wants to make that choice. Um, thanks, Ken. And um, I mean, I, I guess the question is sort of what's driving that? So one, um, what's driving the, the sort of decline in global standing? You know, one, one interpretation might be that uh, countries are looking to a kind of illiberal turn um, in China and not liking what they see and perhaps uh, feeling um, concern about the U.S. as well. And I wonder how, how do you all think about um, the role of, uh, for lack of a better word, illiberalism um, in, in Chinese-U.S. relations? I mean, I have, I have, my sense of is that we are encouraging each other's own bad behavior. And there's, um, I, I don't think it's a coincidence, for example, that in the same year that the United States or in the same couple of years that the United States did uh, a ban that was basically trying to ban people from Muslim countries from coming into the United States in 2016, uh, the following year, China began to set up re-education camps in Xinjiang uh, to put Muslim minorities through a kind of re-education and a, an attempt to sort of, you know, cleanse religious practices uh, out of them. I think those two things are related. I think in both cases, the, the governments have um, encouraged each other's um, bad behavior and this turn towards the liberalism that we see in China um, is also seen in the United States. And in some cases, maybe eerily um, an attempt, rather, we used to talk about, um, the Chinese government used to complain about something called peaceful evolution, and it was this notion that the United States was trying to make China like us. Um, but recently the Trump administration announced a campaign for patriotic education, which is actually borrowed from, from China. So I think this illiberalism is a global trend. Um, and it's, it's not as if the United States is at the current, in the current period, uh, battling against it, it's actually joining into it. Uh, very, very disturbing uh, at times, to say the least. And I, I'd say, you know, we're even seeing it on the University of Michigan campus uh, and in college campuses across the country. There's a debate about the role of Chinese students 
Um, the Department of Justice has a China initiative. You know, how should we think about U.S. policy um, in higher education towards uh, Chinese nationals? So I would I, I would say that the most important way that the United States has um, built a reputation and uh, built a good reputation, improved this reputation in China, is by taking international students. And this is not just restricted to China; all over the world, people come to the United States for school. They come to take advantage of our you know our academic freedom um, as well as you know our high tech development, um, and they return. Turn, you know, having not just, you know, encountered the United States through President Trump, they return having encountered the U.S. through, you know, our people and our civil society institutions, um, you know, and our institutions of higher learning. Um, one of the most dangerous things I think you see in this sort of um, move by some members of Congress say that we should reduce the number of Chinese students or the moves by the State Department to say that um, Chinese students who come from certain universities um, or who might be Communist Party members shouldn't come to the United States to study. I think that's incredibly damaging. Um, it's, you know, not giving our best argument um, for world recognition, for world approval. It's not giving that a chance to work. Um, I should also say that I think it is it's important for the U.S. to recognize that China, of course, is a global competitor. It's important for the U.S. to understand, you know, when um, classified research, you know, should be classified, um, and for obviously American academics to understand those rules as well. But what I think you see in some parts of the American. Um, law enforcement and foreign service these days is a real fear that China's economic um, growth is a threat to American security. And therefore that anything that improves China's economic growth um, is a problem for the United States is something that we should um, is something that we should prevent. And that's, you know, 180 degrees opposite from the kinds of policies that um, can um, help the U.S. pursue when he was, you know, in the White House, which are, you know, no, I, as China's people um, are wealthier, are more educated, are more integrated into the world system, they will be better neighbors for us. Um, and so sometimes I hear the FBI director, Christopher Wray, um, said to Congress that we need a whole of society approach um, to prevent um, China from taking advantage of us. And that's, I can't tell you how misdirected that is. Thank you, Anne. Mary, I know you've also done a lot of work in this area. Uh, what's your perspective on uh, the role of um, Chinese students in, in U.S. universities and more broadly in our society and and what posture should the U.S. be taking? I totally agree with everything that Anne has just said about the misguided approach. Um, there are something like last year, 360,000 Chinese students, including mostly undergrads and, and graduate students getting degrees. Um, overwhelmingly, those students are self-funded. Their parents uh, have chosen usually many years in advance that their student, their, their child will go to the United States for higher education. They're making a choice that they think this system is better. Um, and by denigrating them wholesale through these types of bills and, and speeches by uh, federal government officials, I think is, is totally counterproductive. There have been cases that have been publicly uh, disclosed by the FBI most of the cases that I've seen involve conflict of interest or conflict of commitment or just outright greed. And those things obviously need to be dealt with. Universities need to get better at dealing with those issues. Um, and, and intellectual property should be protected. There should be research ethics, obviously. But I think this kind of wholesale approach and the complete denigration of Chinese students wholesale is in 10 years, we will see the effects. And the effects will be, there will be more Chinese students in Canada, there'll be more Chinese students in Australia, there'll be more Chinese students in Europe. Thanks, Mary. 
Um, let's try and um, uh, tackle some of the other hot button issues um, of the day. Um, uh, there's so many. Uh, the um, we, we talked briefly about uh, Chinese persecution of Muslims. Um, there's obviously been a, a, a crackdown um, in in Hong Kong. How should the U.S. can think about the role of uh, human rights questions in its relationship with China? It's a very tough issue. Uh, China uh, commits a lot of human rights violations in the, by international norms, no question about it. Uh, they, uh, though, see these as basically uh, security issues. Uh, in Northwest China, that Uyghurs uh, have engaged in some terrorist acts, some Uyghurs have, uh, and they see uh, terrorism as a potentially huge threat to China, uh, and they're taking a, a, an approach that goes from, that was previously more in the direction of uh, we'll try to win over Uyghurs, uh, we'll uh, you know, educate some of them in Beijing and the National Minorities Institute will guarantee some uh, special privileges for them in local governance and so forth. But overall, you know, we'll keep them within bounds. Uh, Xi Jinping has really changed that. And what he's talking about now is uh, assimilation. So by undermining uh, the religious beliefs, religious practices, cultural traditions, even dress codes of minorities that he is concerned about. And they have been doing that in Tibet. Uh, they're doing it in Xinjiang. It's producing some terrible human rights violations. Uh, it is always very difficult to get another country to change its behavior toward its own citizens. And uh, I think it's right to raise the issue. It is right to, to press on it in public forums it is right to you know, bar the importation of goods produced by you know, you know, forced labor, absolutely. Uh, but it, you know, we have to be uh, realistic about what will actually change in China as a result of our efforts. And I think on these issues, uh, very little if anything will change. In fact, I think they will probably crack down harder uh, insofar as they see us pointing to the problem. Uh, so it, it's one of those terrible issues where you just kind of sit there and wring your hands and say, I wish there was more I could do that would be effective in improving the lives of the people that we're talking about. But uh, we've never quite figured out how to do that, especially with a country the scale of China. I mean, this is not, uh, this is not, uh, with this way, we've had a tough time even in places like Haiti or Cuba, or very close to us, uh, that somehow or other don't seem to do exactly what we'd like them to do domestically. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I'm going to start to weave in some audience questions as we talk um, into, into my own. And one of the questions that uh, has come through from the audience is about the kind of war over technology that's happening right now. Uh, a lot of the US Chinese um, relationship um, has uh, seen these sparks on particular um, uh, uh, forms of technology, high technology like uh, who is going to control the 5G network of the future. Uh, and there's been a, a deep fight about that um, for, for a number of years now. Uh, more recently, uh, controversy over um, uh, the TikTok app, uh, WeChat Pay, um, and other uh, and and other forms of um, uh, uh, sort of consumer-facing uh, technology. I'm wondering um, what you all think about the shape of this uh, fight. Um, is it a good fight? Uh, fight worth having? Um, what what should its shape be? Why why is it going on? Uh, where do we go from here? And maybe Mary, you could start us out with that. So. I mean, this is not an area I'm a particular expert in. I read a lot about it. Um, I have a couple of thoughts about it that I just wanted to express and maybe Ken or Ann can um, disagree with me. But my sense is first is that the ban on WeChat and the ban on TikTok um, 
of the proposed ban is mostly performative, um, that it's unlikely to one happen, um, and two, to be effective. Like I, I do think there are issues related to personal data security um, in the United States, very broadly speaking. Um, that has sometimes something to do with Chinese companies, but it's not. It's certainly not only about Chinese companies. But I think um, the kind of high profile announcements by the Trump administration are more for uh, consumption, domestic consumption right before an election. Uh, I don't get the sense that they're going to actually happen, nor do I get the sense that they're gonna be very effective. Thanks, Mary. Ken, what's your um, perspective on this? Um, I think that uh, technology competition is real, uh, it's important. The way we should be approaching it uh, is by investing more in our own education and technology careers uh, and uh, and protecting our our innovation ecosystem. Our innovation ecosystem has relied very heavily on our ability to attract the best and the brightest from around the world, uh, stimulate them with an environment here, both in education and then follow on careers uh, that uh, that gives them the opportunity to really make major major breakthroughs, uh, to, to elaborate, to develop their talents and put them to work. We benefited enormously from that. And, and obviously you have to always pay attention to counterintelligence, you know, to where technology is being stolen. You wanna go after that real hard, uh, but we should be able to do that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the notion of of uh, improving our innovation capability by barring uh, students from China who are some of the best around in AI, in quantum computing, and other advanced uh, areas uh, is, to my mind, shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, they will go elsewhere or they will stay in China and the Chinese are now, again, beefing up their education and other opportunities for these folks to do that, and it hurts us very badly. So I would keep an open system uh, and uh, target our counterintelligence efforts and perhaps devote more resources to them so that where there is a serious breach, you nail it quickly and make them pay for it. And uh, a number of questions from the audience uh, center around uh, the idea of what's the role of ideology in the conflict between the United States and China. If you were to, you know, set to the side economic security um, and other interests and, and ask how much does ideology matter in that, in that conflict? So I, I want to point to something Mary said a little earlier, which is that the liberalism in the two countries really, you know, eggs the other on. Um, I had the opportunity to speak to a, a Chinese official who was visiting um, the United States, um, and I asked him about Xinjiang, and he said, I don't understand why, you know, Americans are so upset about Xinjiang. Doesn't President Trump dislike Muslims too? <laughs> and it was just, it was a, you know, a real moment of, you know, sort of awareness, you know, that our, um, you know, that our prejudices um, and our behavior have influences on other people. Um, so on the ideology issue, I think I would point to two things. I think there is definitely a difference in ideology. Um, it is a difference um, about you know, beliefs, uh, about the importance of security, of national security, as um, Ken was talking about earlier. Um, one of the things I, you saw this summer, just as the um, demonstrations in Hong Kong were um, reviving, of course, we had all of these protests for racial justice here in the United States. Um, and for many of the, our, the, my Chinese friends and relatives, um, and, you know, sort of reading what was going on on WeChat, you know, China thought the U.S. was about to burn up. I mean, they, they were horrified at the kind of protests that we were having in the streets and, you know, were really look, waiting for the moment when the tanks would roll down the street in the U.S. 
Um, whereas, you know, I think Americans are in different places about, you know, protest movements and racial protests. But those people who thought we should send tanks in the street, and there were a few of them, um, were vastly outnumbered by those who understand that, you know, protest and expression um, and the, uh, the need to make yourself a better place, the self-improvement, right, um, is an important part of the American creed. Um, I think China coming out of a world in which A, it used to be much more restricted and B, where much of the power of the government um, is in this sort of bargain that the people will be quiet if we improve their living standards. I think those are real differences. Um, having said that, I should say something else, which is both China and the US share one thing in common in our national ideologies, which is that both, each country thinks it's exceptional. Each country thinks that it is, you know, that that it is a leader um, and should be a leader of the world. Um, each country thinks that its own system, its own culture, its own traditions, its own history, you know, is really special. And I think that um, some of what we react to in China is um, a it is is a reaction to that sort of cultural understanding really suffusing um, many of their pronouncements, many of their policies. Can I add something too about? Yeah. Um, I think one thing that is I, I agree with what Anna is, is talking about the exceptional um, the exceptionalism in both countries. I think that poses a real danger to U.S. foreign policy currently. If you've been reading the speeches by um, Secretary of State Pompeo or Christopher Wray or, or other um, executive branch uh, leaders, the thing that they've post appointed to most about China that makes China dangerous is communism, right? This, this idea that it's really about the Communist Party and an attempt to sort of separate the Chinese people from, from, from communism. They haven't done that successfully, particularly with the discussion of whole of society, which basically lumps everybody together with the party. Because what hap the question then is, is what happens if the Communist Party didn't rule China? Would China not be a competitor? it probably would still be a competitor. The Chinese dream that Xi Jinping talks about is not a communist party dream. It is a dream that he, he can broadly articulate to speak to the entire population about their ambitions and China's you know historical uh, position in the world. So I don't think that the United States has really solved this question of how do you live with China, whether it's communist or not communist, how do you live with it? Thanks, Mary. Ken, I wonder whether you could um, talk to us a little bit about uh, the internal Chinese political scene. Um, what's Xi's status? What's the um, what, what's the likely um, path uh, in the in the next five to ten years? What are the internal dynamics of uh, politics in China that might influence the U.S. relationship with China? You know, I. I think it is very hard to get the kind of information about what is going on in the Chinese leadership that we used to have access to. Uh, and uh, it's hard because uh, by all outward indications, Xi Jinping really has eliminated many of his enemies within the leadership and within the higher ranks of the bureaucracy uh, and has centralized decision-making at the top uh, in his own hands uh, to an extraordinary degree. Uh, and part of that is extraordinary control over Chinese media. Uh, and uh, the, the social media are, are more dynamic, but the formal media are, are now uh, uh, controlled more tightly uh, than I have seen in many decades. Um, and so it, it, it is hard to know exactly what the fault lines are near the top, how secure his position is. Uh, he acts on the one hand, very confident, but on the other hand, he has spent more uh, energy changing the personal guards of other, that surround other leaders uh, and taking other measures that indicate that he thinks he's at real risk. Uh, 
Uh, and so, you know, formally, he is now uh, able to be uh, the head of state for, you know, more than two terms in office. Uh, he heads the party. He heads the military. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's just hard to know uh, how, let me put it this way. If something were to happen to Xi Jinping, it would be really quite uh, quite a, uh, it would open up a lot of issues because they have no real processes in place to handle that kind of crisis. Uh, secondly, and I'll stop here because uh, I know time is short, uh, they are now facing domestic problems of a huge magnitude. Uh, demographically, uh, their, uh, uh, their population is aging, uh, extremely rapidly uh, because of their one child policy for decades. Uh, they are having a change in the ratio of working age population to those either too young or too old to work. Uh, that is extremely adverse. Uh, as Mary mentioned earlier, they have uh, several hundred million rural workers who are in the cities and have been for decades, uh, but who do not enjoy urban rights in terms of education, in terms of social services, and so forth. Uh, and they haven't been able to solve that problem. Uh, they have environmental constraints that are extraordinary. Uh, and so uh, they really have a lot of domestic difficulties. And frankly, they struggle to keep up with that at the same time that they're, that they're uh, taking a bigger role internationally. Very complicated situation. Thanks, Ken. Um, uh, another set of audience questions, um, as you'd expect, uh, what, what would happen if um, President um, uh, Trump uh, is not reelected, if uh, Vice President Biden uh, comes in? What should U.S. policy be? What do you expect it to be? And um, th that's a big, a big uh, a topic area. And maybe each of you could take a, a piece of it that you want to talk about and, and uh, delve further in. I know, Mary, do you want to um, get us started with the piece that you'd like to, to focus on? Well, if people have been watching uh, the debates, particularly the vice president debate, where I think we expected to hear more about uh, the China policy of the Biden administration, um, there, hasn't, there hasn't been a, as much information as we would expect. I think partly that's because um, it's not really something I think Biden should campaign about. Uh, it, against Trump, I don't think it helps him, particularly in a domestic audience. Like Ken and Ann mentioned, the public opinion polls, um, you know, China's very, very unfavorable right now among the US electorate. Um, on the other hand, I do expect that, that a Biden administration would behave differently uh, in terms of how it would, I think the policies will remain much more um, restrictive and, and much more suspicious of China but I think that the the way those policies will be implemented, both domestically and also with our allies, will really be quite different from the Trump administration. Thanks, Mary. Ken? I, mean, I think the, uh, uh, the Biden administration, first of all, a lot will depend on uh, whether the Senate turns uh, Democratic, whether the Democratic majority or not. Uh, and so, you know, this is an administration that may not have nearly as much leeway as the campaign is suggesting that it would like to have. Uh, but uh, fundamentally, I think that Biden's approach will be to try to stabilize relations with allies and partners in Asia, which uh, he sees as damaged. Uh, I think he will invest in infrastructure domestically and try to bring the country together more. Uh, my uh, thinking about U.S.-China relations historically is that those relations are best when uh, both countries feel they are doing relatively well domestically. And uh, they give them a kind of confidence to then address real issues with the other side rather than, you know, uh, acting in peculiar ways. Uh, Biden certainly will uh, open up the, the U.S. to um, uh, to much more active, positive policies on major international issues like climate change. Uh, I think also on public health and pandemic preparation, which we did a lot of cooperation with on with China uh, during the Obama administration. And uh, 
President Trump walked away from that at the start of his administration, and we paid a very high price for it. Uh, so I, I think we'll see not so much major changes in immediate policy toward China. I think it will be more stable and steady, uh, but and better coordinated. But fundamentally, uh, Biden will try to address issues where there are issues that we need to cooperate with China on, and he'll be more open to that on those issues. Uh, and otherwise try to repair our relations in Asia and uh, and also domestically uh, get this country together again. And to the extent that he succeeds in that, uh, I think you'll find China will be more uh, interested in cooperating with us. Thanks, Ken. Anne? Um, so I agree with everything that Mary and Ken have just said. I would just add that um, President, Vice President Biden, especially um, in the primaries, was pretty outspoken about China's human rights record. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important. Um, he also at times personalized it by talking about President Xi, and I think that's a mistake. Um, but what I think is important for us to realize is that China, um, despite the crackdown on its internal media, um, Chinese, Chinese people understand how to get information from out, from other parts of the world. Um, and that's much more possible now than it was in the 1990s, for instance. Um, and so if you look at what happened in Xinjiang, what's happening in Xinjiang, for instance, three years ago, um, when the re-education camps were first built, China was on record as saying nothing like that was going on. They were completely denying their existence. And it is international attention, um, international condemnation that forced China to sort of to change its stance and admit that they were building these camps. And, and then, of course, to argue that, you know, that there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I, so I think we have to understand what we can do in China and what we can't. What we can do is shed light on what's happening. What we can do is sort of influence the cultural realm where I, you know, where people interact and, you know, people and, and people's minds are broadened. Um, I think it's not sustainable for us to expect that if we condemn something happening in China, that it will stop um, any more than it is sustainable for China to expect that if it points to our own human rights abuses, that we will stop. Thanks, Anne. Uh, another question from the audience is about um, what advice you all would give to students. Uh, U.S. students um, here or in China, Chinese students in China or here, about trying to deepen their understanding of each other's cultures, societies, and, and the path forward. I mean, I, I realize that, um, you know, we're speaking to alumni and we're speaking to, to probably some current students. Um, I, I'm, I'm totally obviously sympathetic. I also have a college age child of my own, how difficult right now it is for students um, across the board, but particularly college students and particularly college students who, like I was in college, studied abroad. Um, the first place I went to, to was China um, in my junior year of university. And uh, COVID has really impacted that um, quite a bit. Obviously, with things like you know Zoom and StreamYard, um, we can we can do these things and reach out to each other. Um, I think absolutely it is fundamental that we continue to educate our students about each country, and there is continues to be just a huge imbalance in terms of what Chinese people know about the US, how many Chinese students come here for degrees, right? They, they stay here for four years. Um, they're completely fluent in English and how few American students um, even study abroad um, and learn a foreign language. We need to, in, in addition to infrastructure, we need to massively improve our ability to train Americans to be culturally competent. And that includes being knowledgeable about China. And you, uh, you take a group of our students every year to China, uh, not, not this last spring because of COVID, but in general, I wonder what your perspective is on this. Um, 
you know, when when our students go over, these are master students, generally people who have worked, who have been in the workforce for um, a few years before coming back to graduate school. Um, and I think Mary's absolutely right. Many of them have traveled abroad. Very few of them have much understanding of China. Um, but their understandings of China are largely positive, and they're largely positive, not because of Chinese policy, but because they've, you know, watched movies and they've talked to Chinese students here in the U.S. Um, they go to China, and I think they are amazed at the level of economic development um, and technological progress that they see in China. I think it really opens their eyes and um, helps them understand how to treat China as an equal. Um, and I think over time, they also are really, um, you know, they, they also start to ask really good questions. And there are really good questions both about how um, many um, areas of Chinese government seem more competent than our own um, government, state and federal, um, but also, you know, how authoritarianism coexists with the kind of, um, you know, networked, you know, network, the network Chinese that they meet. Um, and I think those are important questions for them to be asking and questions that I wish all of our students had the chance to discover on their own. For Chinese students, I will say that I think the, the fact that we there are so many Chinese students in the US these days makes it possible for Chinese students to have a Chinese life in the US. And I think that's really problematic. Um, of course, you should spend time, you know, meeting, hanging out with other Chinese who, you know, who will be your colleagues um, in the future. Um, but it's an extraordinary time, that opportunity you have to meet people from a different country and to really interact, learn their culture, you know, try to approach people on their own terms. Um, that's what we see when we bring our students to China and what I hope Chinese students in the US will experience. That's great, Anne, thank you. Uh, we only have a, a couple minutes left, and what I'd like to do is just give each of you the opportunity uh, to leave our audience with one thought uh, that you wanna make sure that they take away from today about uh, where we are in the US-China relationship, but maybe even importantly, um, how we're gonna find a path to make it a little bit better. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, Ken, put you on the spot first. Thanks very much, Michael. I appreciate that. Uh, where we are is a very dangerous place. Uh, we are, this uh, dynamic has been spiraling downhill in almost every dimension of our relationship. And each of us is presenting the other in increasingly caricature like terms uh, that make it very difficult to see where the paths forward are, where our overlapping interests are and how to deal with each other. Um, I think the path forward has got to be in part that we uh, recognize that the biggest problems each of our countries confronts uh, require cooperation. Uh, they, they aren't limited to or defined by our own boundaries. The pandemic is a good example of that. And uh, we need to uh, begin to focus um, sure, there are areas of competition. There are certainly areas of conflict of interest, but we have to resume dialogues and look for uh, where constructive cooperation can take place uh, and begin to make that a legitimate goal uh, rather than some sort of being soft on, on an adversary. Uh, Mary, I think I've, I've left you about 20 seconds. Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll try to note, uh, end on a note of optimism, particularly for people who are not in the United States in the sense that um, the, the United States is definitely going through something these days, um, not just related to the pandemic, but related to the politics and, and the polarization. On the other hand, um, I think it's a necessary, uh, some of the things that we're talking about, like race, um, is is necessary for us to do and that's an important thing for the for us to go through um however um things in michigan are good and um ann arbor is beautiful because it's the fall um so 
I, I just, I want to note, like, we're, we're, we're surviving. We've got this. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Anne, I think, unfortunately, we hit the hit the timer, but um, right. it's been lovely talking with all three of you. I learned a ton, and I know our audience did. And uh, as always, go blue. Go blue. Go blue. Go blue.